Uh, my name is Andrew Lambert. It's my great privilege to chair this session, and I have two professors and two officers who will each, in their own distinctive ways, uh, add to our discussion of Admiral Ramsey's career. Uh, my first speaker is Professor Paul Kennedy, who is not only the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History, uh, Director of International Security Studies, um, and many other things at Yale University, uh, but he is single-handedly responsible for me being here because his book of 1976, The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery, was the first intelligent book of naval history I ever read. And I contacted him at that time, uh, and he set me on the right path, but I had the good sense not to attempt to do anything else. He <laughs> promptly left the country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although the two events, I'm sure, were not connected. Uh, Paul is going to speak about Ramsey and Eisenhower, uh, stressing that he is from these shores, but he has um, plied his trade on those shores. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, what a magnificent uh, mm -hmm. first part of our second session. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I cannot do anything other than to uh, stress that I cannot emulate what you have done. Uh, I have no intention of keeping up uh, with uh, Ramsey Wren. Um, I'd like to begin my remarks, ladies and gentlemen, by thanking Churchill College and uh, the Ramsey family, and Alan Packwood in particular, for arranging this. It's a terribly important conference. It is high time that Ramsey was uh, recognized for being the master organizer that he was. It is tragic that he was not there to receive full honors at the end of a war. Uh, we are doing, trying to make up, if I may say so, to the Ramsey family. Uh, today. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Ramsey and, and Eisenhower. I spent a few years partly in, this, in the college uh, library trying to work on a book which was about the engineers of war, about people who got things done, and I was particularly interested when I got to chapter four of my book on how to do amphibious operations in the Second World War uh, that uh, Ramsey had to play a, a prominent part all the, all the way through. I, say nothing about the war in the Pacific, which I dealt with in another chapter, but I was astonished by the uh, meticulous nature of Ramsey's uh, performance, his great intelligence, his capacity to get on well uh, with his fellows, with Americans, and clearly with the Wrens. Um, let me say a little bit about this, this topic, and uh, just, just a few points to make w uh, clear which, which aspects I, I can cover and say with. Uh, first of all, uh, Ramsey as the person who, who got the army off in 1940 and then got the army uh, back again. Uh, I was reminded of a quote, I think it's from, um, I don't know who it's from, uh, Bacon, I think, uh, Nicholas Roger over there will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which was to the effect that uh, he who has command of the sea may take as much or as little of the war as he will. And I thought that Ramsey was a sort of epitome of what Bacon had in mind when he wrote those words in the, in the 1580s. You can with sea power take as much or as little of a war, provided, of course, you can get your army off promptly and expeditiously, and then you can get your army on promptly and expeditiously. And this is what Ramsey's talents uh, concentrated upon. He, uh, after his Dover command, which was lasted for two years after the Dunkirk operation because of a fear of invasion down the channel, moved over to, uh, to Gibraltar and uh, joined uh, Eisenhower there. If you ever go and land at Gibraltar and get to the, to, to the very bottom of the cave at the bottom of that great rock, you will see the, the planning room in Gibraltar, which is rather like the war cabinet planning room or the admiralty planning room, the plot room in London. And it's where that, uh, that uh, Eisenhower stayed for quite a while, people wondering where Eisenhower was and where they could look out across the straits and see uh, where the operation was to take place. Let me say a, a few things about this. First of all, it was to be most meticulous. It had to be. There were large political considerations in getting, Admiral, in getting Operation Torch right. It was the first 
first operation ever that the Americans had conducted in Europe, after all. Um, and it had to be right. It had to be right for, for Roosevelt. It was now in November, October, November 1942. The Americans had been brought into the war because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. There's a much, uh, much a comment in the American press and in the American Senate about when were we going to, to fight, when were we going to see action, and why were we going to fight on the, uh, uh, in the European theater when really we should be fighting in the Pacific theater. So this, there's very high political stakes here. It had to go right for the Americans, and they, they needed to, to be there and to yet without much experience of, of landing and of, of big op, uh, amphibious operations. It was also terribly important for the British. They did not have, as Corelli Bonnet has shown and engaged the enemy more closely, they did not have a very good track record in amphibious operations to that part, apart from the Madagascar operation, which might have been a rather good practice for them. Long distance operation, amphibious operation, <coughs> coming from the Clyde, a joint operation, getting people on from the ships and onto the northern part of, of Madagascar. But this was to be bigger than anything else, and uh, it had to have a good planner. And I always, always suspect that the reason why Backhouse, who was uh, Ramsey's chief in, in the mid-1930s, why he and uh, Ramsey could not get on very well was this difference of temperament and this difference of approach. Backhouse was the old-fashioned stay uh, at, the, at the rudder all the time. The chief had to be there in control of everything. Ramsey could see that a, a war coming had to be done with a great deal of delegation to staff work. You had to have the best staff, you had to have the best subordinates, you had to trust them. The commander in chief could not be in charge of anything. He had to do his best to get everything prepared and then leave it to his subordinates. And of course, leave it to the weather and leave it to the fates. And the second thing about it was, was that um, you, you, had to, you had to have at least some understanding of how it looked from, the, from below, from the bottom. And I didn't, don't think Backhouse had much in the way of, of, uh, of a sense of how those subordinate to him worked. It had to be the most detailed operation, uh, both at uh, Torch and again at Husky, and then in particular at, at D-Day itself. If you look at the British official history, Ramsey's official, sorry, I beg your pardon, Roskell's official history of the war at sea, and look at that great map of all of the details of everything coming in to the shore, and we're going to hear something about that in a few minutes. You staggered by the amount of detail, by the amount of, of pieces in the great jigsaw which had to go together. I've often showed that map to American CEOs who are in charge of the most powerful companies in the world, like IBM, and I've showed it to them and I said, oh my God, we could never, ever do anything like that. That's a testimony to what was going on. Eisenhower respected immediately the meticulousness, the carefulness, and, and also the friendship of Ramsey, There's, uh, it did depend a great deal upon temperament, that the Americans and the English got on with each other, and some English did not get on very well with Americans, and some Americans did not get on very well with the British. And it seems that from the beginning, uh, Eisenhower and, and Ramsey got on very well. It was particularly important in the planning which was done to make sure, and they had a good geographic opportunity, that the American forces and the British forces were not landed on the same beach, did not get entangled in any way. Nobody could blame the other for things going wrong by saying, you got on my little bit of beach, or you tripped me up, or anything else like that. So if you, if you look at the torch operation, you'll see that the American forces come a long, long way across the Atlantic from Newport News, from, from Florida, to land on the Atlantic shores of North Africa, in other words, on the, on the Morocco shores, and uh, learned quite a bit from that experience. The, uh, the American uh, control ship was, was not a control ship as the British had. It was, it was on board the uh, Augusta, which had to disappear in a, uh, to fight off, uh, or attempt to fight off 
French, uh, Vichy French destroyers, uh, but on, it did very well. And what's more, it landed very safely on those rough Atlantic rollers. The British force coming from the Clyde went through the Straits of Gibraltar and then turned in to, a, to take over, to land on the, on the ports and around the ports of, of Algeria. Two British destroyers were sent into the harbors, uh, shot to pieces, thus confirming Nelson's uh, attic that uh, ports and destroyers and ports and ships didn't really work. But uh, with the Vichy French dis de deciding to have their negotiated a peace with Dala uh, coming forward to do that, then the operation was over. It had been a complete success apart from those destroyers. It had confirmed that things could go well. It, it was a lesson in meticulous operation, a lesson in Anglo-American cooperation. And the, the benefits were quite clear. The Mediterranean was now open on each side of the Straits of Gibraltar. I say a little about uh, Ramsey and Eisenhower uh, regarding the Sicily operation, except to notice once again, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, Eisenhower had the greatest respect for Ramsey and getting the forces on from the ships and the landing craft onto the shore of southern and south eastern Sicily. Once again, the two uh, armies were divided. The American armed forces were to land in the western part of the island and to move uh, across towards... Uh, Towards Palermo, this is where uh, Patton could uh, rejoice in his swift overland operations. Uh, Montgomery's forces were landed in the southeast for a more crowded area and to advance up that beaten coast past Syracuse, past where the uh, unfortunate Athenian army was landed and destroyed, and head on to, to Messina. Two other things uh, worth noting there. Uh, there were eight armies landed uh, in the south of Sicily. So it was the largest amphibious uh, operation in, in the Second World War until I think the plans were there after Okinawa for the amphibious landing of, of Japan. It was divided between the Americans in the west and the British in the east. The, uh, the, the myth that uh, the British were slow under Montgomery and the Americans were fast under Patton was to carry from um, the Sicily expedition to the to, to DDA itself, but in fact, of course, the Montgomery, this more meticulous, slower-moving general, could attract larger, more uh, fully equipped tank uh, German forces in resistance against the British, British uh, um, casualties in, in this uh, Sicilian operation were considerably longer and larger, but at the end of the day, both worked, and therefore, the two men could work together again when, Montgomery, when Eisenhower was pulled back from the Mediterranean to be put in charge at the, at the demand and the agreement of, of Roosevelt and Churchill for the difficult D-Day operation. So there's, the, the, to stress this, there is then this cooperation between the two men. They get on very well with each other. They know each other. There's certain jibes about Ramsey being rather meticulous and rather straight up and down. But on the other hand, I think they got on very, very well together. And therefore, they brought the whole staff back. The whole Mediterranean joint planning staff came back with Eisenhower. He did not need to rely upon new forces, new commanders of, at sea or in the Air Force or anything else like that. Um, the planning went ahead. We're going to hear much about that. Eisenhower clearly relied upon Ramsey to be there to, to cover and be responsible for the maritime aspect of this operation. He did not mind that the Royal Navy was going to call it a different name from Operation Overlord. Uh, Neptune was coming from the sea, and the Royal Navy was entitled to call it Operation uh, Neptune. So there they were uh, together very, very closely. The decision made on the 5th to go ahead, Ramsey was quite firm that it had to take place. There were too many men tossing around already in, in, in the ships at the very many harbors in the south of England. And with Montgomery and Ramsey pressing for this, with this opening in the weather conditions, the, the, the scene was set for this great amphibious operation on the following day. And the the, the sort of the dynamo, dynamism of the whole thing, and then, of course, the, 
the, the, the waiting, the tense waiting which we just heard about overnight until everything takes place with the, the forward operations going, the seal operations, the, the, the various operations to clear the, clear the mines and everything else like that. The seven, sorry, beg your pardon, the five operations go according to plan. Uh, in most cases, in four out of five, they go very, very well indeed uh, with all of the planning for the landings for, for Percy Hobart's funnies and uh, with all of the over uh, the, the flights ahead. Uh, Eisenhower is said to have told his men that if you look up and you see an aircraft above you tomorrow, it will be an Allied plane. I believe there were 1,120 uh, Anglo-American Polish uh, fighters and bombers over the beaches on the morning of, uh, of D-Day. Uh, no chance for the Luftwaffe to, to intervene at all. Quite nice that Churchill insisted that it was the uh, Polish Spitfire squadrons which had done so well in the Battle of Britain which were to fly low cover over the, the beaches uh, on the 6th of June. The possible disaster at, at Omaha clearly gripped both Eisenhower and, and Ramsey, and there was that although Ramsey felt pleased at the end of the 6th of June and wrote, on the whole, we have done very well, but the anxiety about what was going to happen and what had happened at Omaha was quite manifest. And so you find the two men together on the next morning in the British destroyer getting closer and closer in, receiving the reports from Hewitt, uh, the American uh, naval commander of the American beaches, uh, and and from from Bradley about what had happened. It seems as if Eisenhower tore Bradley down a little bit for not being all that good in commanding on Omaha. Uh, relied very very much on Ramsey, and then of course the sight was seen of the American Rangers getting to the top of the Pont du Hoc, and it was all over. The the fifth operation had been successful. After all, I will stop there except to note that when Eisenhower heard of the death of Ramsay, he was very, very choked up indeed. His, his, uh, his main aide, uh, Colonel Butcher, talks about this, that, that uh, Eisenhower goes there, immediately cancels his, uh, his duties, and is there, I believe I'm right, as the chief mourner at the time of the of the of the funeral itself, he felt he had he had lost a very very great friend as well as a very very great colleague, and it was a this is a, a epitome of Anglo-American amphibious operation. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will leave it at that with the expression of, of great honour at being invited to be here and to talk about Eisenhower as well as Ramsay at this conference. Thank you all very very much indeed, Andrew. <laughs> Our next speaker is Admiral Richard Hill, who, after a, a long and distinguished career, both at sea and in Whitehall with the Royal Navy, uh, went on to run some lawyers in the, <laughs> in the Middle That's Temple, which must have been even more trying than running sailors, uh, and has had a very significant career publishing works not on, only on contemporary naval policy, strategy, and issues, but also editing the Oxford hist History of the Royal Navy and writing a biography of Admiral Lord Lewin. And he is going to speak about the role of the Navy on D-Day. Richard, the floor is yours. Uh, Admiral Ramsey was ANCXF. He was the Allied Naval Commander-in-Chief Expeditionary Force. And each word in that title has meaning. Operation Neptune had to be an Allied operation because only by harnessing the resources of all the Allies could it hope to succeed against a still powerful and determined enemy well established along the coastline and in France. It must be primarily a naval operation because airborne forces alone could not possibly generate the effort necessary to defeat that enemy. The main delivery must come from the sea, supported by land-based air forces. The force from the sea must be expeditionary force. That's to say, it must be capable of sustainment from the sending countries themselves. And finally, it had to be a very substantial force at a level insisted on by Montgomery and supported by Ramsey. 
Well, the one word in the title I haven't mentioned is Commander-in-Chief, and that's what we're here about. <coughs> Let's talk some staff language. The key word, always notably present in military circles, and even more notably absent in political ones, is AIM. The selection and maintenance of the AIM is a prime tenet of staff work. What was the AIM of Operation Neptune? Well, it's stated in the operation order. To carry out an operation from the United Kingdom to secure a lodgment on the continent from which further operations can be developed. The general plan emerging from this objective was a five-division assault on a 50-mile stretch of coast in Normandy, by far the largest amphibious enterprise in history. And I hope I'm still talking staff language. What were the factors affecting the attainment of the aim? It's customary and right to start with geography, and in the maritime sphere that includes hydrography. Well, there was already some information on that coastline and its sea and land approaches. Admiralty charts covered the SC area well enough for peacetime use and mapped land contours and roads were in line with the peacetime function of an agricultural area and holiday playground. It was something for the planners to go on. But for a large-scale assault landing, more was needed. Crucially, information on beach gradients, composition of beaches, beach exits and salient ground features. Similarly, in general terms, astronomical data, tides and tidal streams were well predicted by British establishments that at that time were probably the most accurate in the world. But some nuances might be required for an assault over the beach. So the planners needed more data. They got much of it over the year before the operation from clandestine activity by the Combined Operations Pilotage Parties, the COPs, and groups of royal engineers who surveyed the beaches in detail, by night and in conditions of great discomfort and hazard. They were landed mostly from submarines or small craft, and an astonishingly high proportion were recovered and survived. The other natural factor affecting the attainment of the aim was the weather. That was a more transient business, of course, but great strides had been made in forecasting over the course of the war, and the geographical position of the British Isles was a help, as was British presence in the Atlantic Ocean, where weather reports were received from any units not subject to radio silence. And then we come to the next element of the staff appreciation, courses of action by the enemy affecting attainment of the aim. Some of these, indeed, were well reconnoitred and were formidable. Hitler's Atlantic Wall was a vast set of coastal fortifications, artillery and beach barriers, with in front of it every sort of sea mine that was at that time available, and behind it troop formations of great potential strength against an invading force. Those land units were of variable effectiveness. Attrition on the Russian front had reduced the quality of the German army. But when one looked at the orders of battle, as well as the inherent advantages of the defence in any land operation, let alone the disadvantages to a force landing from the sea, then those five divisions in the initial Allied assault were surely going to be needed. There were some plus factors to cheer the planet of Neptune, as the overlord in general. The first was Allied dominance in the air. This improved almost every prospect, from reconnaissance at one end to interdiction at the other. The assumption, all inherent though not guaranteed in the operation order, was that the landings would proceed without serious operation from the Luftwaffe was crucial. The second positive factor was the absence in theatre of heavy German surface forces, these had been drawn off by British naval activity in the north, principally the convoys to Russia, and attenuated even there by such actions as the German Navy did undertake. The Scharnhorst had been sunk late in 1943 
and the Tirpitz was besieged in Altenfjord. And then my, my countermeasures progressed in both expertise and intensity. And the magnetic mine threat could be countered by degaussing and some new sweeping methods and pressure mines, the most dangerous of all, could partly be scotched by the use of slow speeds. Finally, 1943 had seen a swing in the submarine war. Anti-submarine forces around the convoys, in support groups, in air patrols, both offensive and defensive, were all in the ascendant. And even the introduction of the Schnorkel to aid concealment of U-boats was only a partial palliative. None of this is to say that Operation Neptune was simply going to be a matter of mustering the transports and wafting them over the channel, as the charming 13th century phrase has it. But all that attrition of enemy potential surely had to help. And it is hugely relevant to the title of this particular talk that that is so. Because if it hadn't been for the efforts of the Royal Navy from 1939 onwards, the conditions for Operation Neptune would have been much more difficult. I don't for a moment imply that it was all the doing of the Navy, but it's fair, I think, to contend that the Royal Navy was in the forefront. Well, let's turn then to the organisation necessary to bring together the transporting and supporting forces for this massive enterprise which was the focus and culmination of the work of Ramsey's staff. The scale and scope of it is dramatically illustrated by the Southwark war map, which is displayed behind me. The original can still be seen at Southwark House, which was the Allied quarter headquarters for Overlord, by appointment only. <coughs> it is set, as you can see, for D-Day, HR, and has been shown there since. D-Day, HR. Those were both critical planning decisions that needed a great deal of inter-allied and inter-service discussion and negotiation. In the upshot, HR was to be in early daylight, half-tide rising, the moon having already illuminated the way for the airborne sorts. That meant that the available slots for D-Day were confined to three a month. In June 1944, that was the 5th to the 7th. So on those five beef chariots between the Orne and the Cotentin Peninsula, five divisions had to be landed at HR and in the hard hours that followed. To deliver that assault, transports alone ran into four figures. The two American beaches to the west, over 700 vessels, in 16 convoys. For the British and Canadian beaches to the east, some 1,400 in 22 convoys. And that isn't to count the, to count the support forces. Over 100 minesweepers to clear the approaches and then buoy the channels, followed by vast covering firepower, provided by seven battleships, 23 cruisers, 105 destroyers, and a host of other craft. Command and control afloat was provided by specially equipped headquarters ships. And the schedule and marshalling of this armada was, as I've said, the culmination of Ramsey's staff work. It was a set piece of a kind in which the Royal Navy had excelled in times of peace and tension and copied but seldom surpassed by other navies, but it had never been attempted on this scale and against opposition. The first decision to be made was the general direction of approach of the Armada and therefore of its mustering areas. Given the landing area, it was in hindsight almost bound to be mainly from the west. And that decision was reinforced by the strength of opposing forces further to the east, particularly in the part of Calais. Most of it would come from the south and west. Convoys had to start sometimes 48 hours before HR to get to their touchdown point, 
and seasickness among the embarked troops was a matter of great concern for planners. Bringing the convoys and their supporting forces together was mighty work. It had to follow the principle of all successful large-scale set pieces. It must be flexible enough to accommodate errors and unexpected events. The intricate scheduling of the convoys and their insulation so far as possible against fixed and mobile threats so as to ensure their timely arrival at the designated beaches was a matter for detail in planning and so far as possible simplification in practice. Two examples stand out from the orders. Area Z, nicknamed Piccadilly Circus, that circle in the middle, uh, an intensive layer mine swept area through which almost all approach forces had to pass, and the Mickey Mouse diagrams that displayed an outline which, where formations had to be at 12 hourly intervals. Making it as simple as possible was not going to make it easy. You try steering across a three-knot tidal stream when your best speed through the water is six knots. The problems of navigation were much alleviated by a technical advance invention, the QM system, which later into general service as the Decker Navigator. This lattice of hyperbolic position lines generated by the phase difference between the master and three slave stations had been rushed into service and was undergoing its first operational test. Subsequent accounts show how well it responded to the requirement. The greatest test of the flexibility of Neptune was the postponement of overload for 24 hours due to weather. The operation order shows that the possibility it foreseen and allowed for. Uh, in any event, the determination of Eisenhower and Montgomery and the judgment of Group Captain Stagg, as is well known, carried the day. So D-Day HR, delayed as it was, happened. The minesweepers swept in, the airstrikes and bombardments were mounted, the paratroopers and the waterborne hit, troops hit their objectives, not always in the planned places, but enough. Great deeds were done, some serious reverses were sustained, most have been well recorded. There may be some perception that the overwhelming preponderance of Allied forces ensured little German opposition at sea after the assault. Certainly, the lockdown in some fields was virtually complete. In the air and against the U-boats, indeed, in hindsight, that can be seen. It probably wasn't so apparent at the time. We now know, for instance, that Dönitz for bad U-boats that were not snorkel equipped to undertake a death ride into the channel. But at that time, they represented a threat, and the RAF as well as RN forces were ready for them. What did happen was determined opposition from heavily outnumbered German destroyer and coastal forces. The destroyers were defeated in a night action off the Isle de Batz on 8th 9th of June, and the Schnellbult in a series of sorties, countered by British, US and Canadian surface forces and by RAF aircraft, not, in, uh, not before they'd inflicted some damage. To sum up, the story of D-Day has been told very often. I tried to approach it from a staff planner's point of view, which tends to be a cool and rational one, and I think it will be close to Ramsey's own approach. The careful weighing of factors, both friendly and enemy, as well as surrounding circumstances of topography, hydrography, tides, weather, and astronomical data, all came into the mix, and all were successfully handled as a masterpiece of forethought and planning. As for the Royal Navy's role, it has been said that 78% of the naval effort in Operation Neptune came from the Royal Navy and the Royal Canadian Navy. That figure may be subject to revision by a few percent, but in the light of history, no more. Credit must be given to all the major actors, not all of them direct. For example, the Soviet Army's weakening or its German opponent from mid-1941, must be acknowledged. But it has to be one of the greatest moments in the proud history of the British Naval Service, and it is a monument to the memory of its principal architect, Bertram Hume Ramsey.
Our next speaker is Richard Harding. Uh, Richard is the head of the Department of Leadership, Development and Organization, and he's the Professor of Organizational History at the University of Westminster, which I think gives you some inclination of what he may be talking about. But he is also uh, a deeply researched his, uh, historian working on the study and evolution of amphibious warfare. So he combines two, I think, particular elements that give us insight into this process. Richard, the floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, I've got to start by confessing a slight bit of leisure de main, because I'm, I'm very much aware that your briefing says management and logistics. I deliberately changed it to management of logistics, because management and logistics, I think, would have made the subject so vast. It would have been very difficult to um, control it. And I wanted to start off with a quotation from one of the men who really had to tackle with this problem of overlord at the very beginning, who, uh, the uh, Chief of Staff, the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, Lieutenant General Sir Frederick Morgan. The whole of air virtually hinged on the rate of movement of men, vehicles and material, sh shore to sea and sea to shore again. Every, it, there was present every sort of opportunity, not only for inter-service rivalry, but for inter-service jealousy and ultimately inter-service conflict. The very fact, as we've been hearing this morning, that this involved a massive amount of tact is, a, is in itself a, 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 a considerable feature of Ramsey's achievement, that there wasn't a vast amount of inter-service conflict and inter-service rivalry. As Paul has mentioned earlier, Ramsey got on well with Eisenhower. We also know how the relationship with Montgomery was built up. It was a major issue. Now, if I can make this work, it depends how you calculate it in terms of how big it was and how significant it was. It was something like a movement of 175,000 troops and with those sort of um, uh, issues as well. However, it's, it isn't just as the landing on D-Day that was important. As Ramsey had written to his wife, this was really, the, as it were, the crust that had to be broken through. Ramsey was very much aware that this was a campaign where the army was going to stay. It wasn't five divisions. As Morgan knew already, long before the, the operation took place, it was going to be something like 100 divisions. It had to cover or control something like 200,000 square miles of complicated territory in northwest Europe. It had potentially to drive, if it was going as far as Berlin, something like 550-odd miles as well. And Ramsey was aware that the, this process of logistics and control had to go through the, through the entire operation. He was aware that the opening of one port was important. We heard this morning about Antwerp being significant. The fact that our Operation Market Garden was mounted as it was, was part of the uh, issue of a lack of resources and logistics to have a wide front approach. And of course, it went through even after Ramsey's death to the considerations of how Bremen was going to be administered as a port of entry for control of Germany thereafter. Now, by 1943, Ramsey was an acknowledged expert on amphibious assault, as we've heard, as an operational art. And in fact, Cunningham and Churchill possibly thought him too much of an expert on amphibious operations and too little concerned about the concerns of the Royal Navy itself. So, logistics was only one part of the naval plan, but it was essential. And I'll just mention management here, partly because Ramsey was, in that respect, an unusual individual. It wasn't normal for naval officers to be very interested in amphibious operations. In 1921, when the Manual for Combined Operations was being re uh, revised, advice was taken from Captain Edward Unwin, who won the Victoria Cross at V Beach in command of the River Clyde, and was later naval transportation officer in Egypt. And he, sa he said that it would take very good pay to make up for what he called the unpalatable training, the loss of honour and glory that went with naval transportation. And as we heard earlier, Ramsey pointed out that people who were involved in amphibious operations, naval officers, couldn't wait to be out of it. Now, um, it wasn't just a naval situation. Patton, I think, gave one of the most interesting views of what he termed the administrative officers, um, he said they were the very human petrification with a heart of feldspar, without charm or friendly germ, minus bowels, passion, a sense of humour. Happily, they never reproduce, and all of them will finally go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> 
Morgan put it rather more subtly when he said he was disappointed to lose control of First Corps and, and he didn't particularly like the idea of the hard work of, of uh, planning operations, but it was something that had to be done. Now, and we already heard that Sir Cunningham was not a particularly um, so interested in planning and therefore left it to Ramsey. Although he said to Ramsey on one occasion, or wrote to Ramsey on one occasion, this craze for liaison officers, in my opinion, getting quite out of bounds. I'm liberally supplied with drivers, but there are no motor cars. So coordination and planning was not exactly his particular interest as well. So it was unusual, and it made Ramsey somewhat unusual. So really, I just wanted to spend the few minutes that I had looking at how Ramsey became that kind of person. What is there in the Ramsey papers that point to a way that he looked at these operations? And we've heard some of them already. One of them, I think, was the, the issue here, as far as the naval officers are concerned, if you look at management, it's not exactly as heroic as leadership. And we don't have much time to go into much beyond that. But Ramsey seemed to take the idea of management far more significantly. It was leadership, certainly, but it was the detailed control of resources, application of resources in the right area that didn't attract all officers. Why? Well, signal specialists sometimes don't get the best uh, press in the world. And Ramsey was a signal specialist. Coordination, command, communication was part of his specialism. It was part of maybe what made up the very detailed, very controlled way he viewed the world. His early command, as we heard this morning, was in coastal mon the coastal monitor and in Broke off Ostend as well. He knew something about coastal operations. He was also at the Imperial Defence College between 1931 and 1933. And some of the things he kept are quite interesting, which exist in the papers here. He kept the references that J, uh, J.F.C. Fuller, one of the Army's intellectuals in this period, about the coordinating brain. He was interested in that idea. He kept information on those war emergencies against Germany, Japan, and Russia. Because although it's true there were no war plans as such during the uh, 1930s. It was perfectly well known that the Japanese could be a significant enemy and, and training and exercises did take place regarding the recapture of territory that had been captured by the Japanese. And for the similar reason maybe, he also kept papers related to Colonel Miles' papers on the inv Japanese invasion of Manchuria and a lecture also on inter-service competition. He was aware of how competition was affecting the staff. Now, we've also heard, as Admiral Commanding Dover, of Operation Dynamo, but he would have been aware equally of Plan W, which he wasn't particularly involved in, was for maintaining the BEF in France should it have stayed. So the massive logistics problems and issues were something that he would have been aware of. 1941... We've heard also about how, during 1941, he made the acquaintance of Montgomery, or more as a commander 12th Corps, and he also had to study issues to do with the German uh, problems of invasion. And he realised at that point that without serious command control resources, a landing across the Channel was a seriously difficult problem. So very slowly... We find in those papers some hints as to what he might have been considering and how his mind might have been developing. 1942, we've also heard that he became Naval Commander-in-Chief Expeditionary Force for Attack on France, the Operation Sledgehammer, the possible attack on Cherbourg that didn't take place. He was planning that from early on. He was diverted, as we've heard, also into planning Torch, the incredibly complex operation requiring movements of troops and materials for across the Atlantic and from the River Clyde. And then in January 1943, as Commander Eastern Task Force, he was in charge of the British-Canadian landings on Sicily. And he was one of the few people in January 43 that actually had the time and the energy in his headquarters in Cairo to carry out detailed planning. And detailed planning was going on there before 
detailed planning could take place elsewhere. So he's in working extremely hard on these things. And then, of course, in October 1943, he is appointed Allied Naval Commander Expeditionary Force. So there's a lot of things within the papers, within his appointments, that suggest his, his career is being constructed, he, or he is constructing his career, around collaboration with the Navy, sorry, with the Army and amphibious operations. But what more do we know about his perceptions of the logistics system? Well, as I said, he was aware of the logistics issues running into the Northwest European campaign that would go right the way through to his command of the Valkyren operation. And no doubt, he, as he was slated by uh, Cunningham to become naval commander in occupied Germany, issues about Bremen would have come under his uh, remit as well. But in September 1943, he produced a fairly long lecture on amphibious operations and the logistics that that involved. It was never given the lecture, although it was edited for publication and, and anonymized. And these are some of the things that he put forward at the, at the end of 1943 for consideration. The first thing that struck him was that there were the limited port facilities at both ends of the sea passage create problems, the bottlenecks at both ends. And the army plan had to include early capture of ports. And we know, of course, that's exactly what it did um, have, but the destruction of those ports made it very difficult to use them. He was aware from Sicily that over-the-beach landing was extremely hazardous. Huskies over-the-beach landings went extremely well. The introduction of the duck as a vehicle for maneuvering um, stores between ships and shore had worked very well. The beaching of landing ships had worked very well, and destroyer, um, destroyer gunfire had worked extremely well as well. However, in the long-term usage of these beaches, they break down. So the quality of the beach breaks down, and therefore it cannot be relied upon as a, uh, a long-term solution to bringing in logistics stores over periods of time. The second thing was the speed of turnaround was critical. Getting vessels in and getting vessels out required extreme control. It couldn't be blocked up at either end of the system. And developing that was quite important as well. Developing the build-up organisation and the turnaround organisation was a significant aspect of Ramsey's contribution. Another thing he was insistent upon was that training had to be con continued during the passage. So as, as one of the key logistical elements that were going to be landed were troops, they couldn't be stuck on, on landing ships for long period of time without training, and maintaining that training was significant. Getting supporting arms ashore fast. Getting artillery ashore. Now, one of the things that the Overlord and planners and Neptune planners were also doing was providing gunfire offshore. The landing craft rocket, the landing craft flak, all these are bits of artillery would provide seaborne artillery for tactical use by the army. But in, in September 43, getting the supporting arms ashore fast was something he saw as very significant. Clearly getting airfields operational was important. Loading and transporting the requirements for the air commander were significant. Extending the power of air control locally was important. All this, of course, implies effective tactical loading. And we, everyone who's worked on amphibious operations is always aware of the horror stories of incorrect tactical loading and actually the things arriving in the wrong place at the wrong time and having lots of equipment that could be very useful if you're in a totally different theatre or something like that. And lastly, the, the security of the beachhead perimeter. This is something that hadn't had the attention it deserved and the establishing a, the, a high quality beach organisation was something Ramsey wanted to ensure occurred. He felt that too often 
the beachhead organization was given to the least promising officers. He wanted the most promising officers to control the beachhead operation. There came a point during the Sicily campaign at, uh, in Operation Husky where a German armored division was advancing on the American beachheads. It looked for a time as though those, um, uh, that panzer division could break through. It was very fortunate there was very effective destroyer gunfire that disrupted that attack. And therefore, Ramsey wished to make sure this became a significant part of the logistical process. Another thing was he wanted to see a centralization of all signals organizations on headquarters ships. This had been tried out during the 1920s and 1930s. There was but a mass of signaling traffic, particularly for air control, made this rather difficult. We have heard earlier about Augusta racing off in pursuit of a potential enemy, I think taking General Patton with him at the time, uh, made life rather difficult for uh, that particular element of the operation. Also in line with this was the assault convoy must get out of the way quickly in order for the follow-up convoys to have access to the beaches. As as we've heard from previous speakers, flexibility was vital. At sea, you cannot plan everything. However, he was very much aware that the landing was to make the army's job possible. So the army's requirements came first, but he was also aware that the army tended to plan very precisely. And therefore, getting a modus operandi and I between the army and the navy, what could be flexible and what could not be flexible, was vitally important. And to be fair, Morgan had picked this up very early, that the different planning assumptions in terms of the flexible plan were vitally important. And lastly, he argued that there should be a professional amphibious planning staff, something that just did not exist prior to the, the Second World War. And the very time that Neptune was taking place, an inter-service committee was reporting on this issue. Should there be a planning staff? And in late June 1944, it was decided that neither the Army nor the Navy could accept that. So there was no planning staff at that point. And just to sum up, just to, find, to, to tail this off with one, his chief of staff's quote, unrivaled knowledge of exper uh, and experience of combined operations was in effect the foundation stone on which detailed planning of naval operations of the invasion was built and build up was based. The question I suppose that follows is was that legacy taken forward or not? Did it go with Ramsey? But his contribution was recognized at the time. He had a massive contribution prior to joining the Neptune uh, event. Um, but what happened afterwards? And that I think is our next speaker's uh, subject. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Our final speaker on this panel is Commodore Michael Clapp. Uh, Michael is another one of those long-serving and distinguished naval officers, and in his case, he was the commander of the Amphibious Task Group in the Falkland Islands in 1982. Uh, so his paper is entitled Commanding an Amphibious Assault, and I suspect he will indeed pick up the question with which the previous speaker ended. Thank you very much. Um, I too am delighted to be here and thank Alan so much for all his hosting. Um, I think the title really should have been in 80, 1982, Commanding an Amphibious Assault, but that wasn't the remit. But that is what I'm going to stick to because that is what I know about. Um, first of all, I'm very grateful to Admiral Ramsey because my father was one of those who came off the beach at Dunkirk. Um, uh, my father actually, incidentally, was then picked up by the Navy in Greece, Crete, and I think in North Africa. <laughs> so when I came to be, uh, when I went to him uh, some years later and said I would like to join, I want to go to sea, um, national service was on, so the only chance was going to go into the Navy, and I ended up uh, 
serving for life. Uh, that wasn't my original intention, but I didn't know that you could do national service in the Navy, and that was kept quiet from me. Um, I think my father didn't want me to go to university and have to pay for it. Um, so, it came as a bit of surprise to me when I found myself in command of an amphibious operation in my last job in the Navy. Um, it was a very exciting time, but uh, there we were. The second part of um, the gratitude to Admiral Ramsey was he was the, as you heard, he, the Navy was not, uh, had no naval staff, uh, am amphibious staff, um, and he set down many of the drills that Julian Thompson's staff and mine worked to in 1982, and this made life a lot easier. During the interim period, uh, there were two very successful amphibious landings. Uh, both were well planned by officers with World War II experience. The first, of course, was the Incheon landings in Korea by the US Navy, US Marine Corps, and elements of 41 Commando Royal Marines. And this severed the North Korean and Chinese logistic routes to South Korea. The other, the Suez campaign, was from a military point of view, a major success and joint one with the French. In it, the Royal Marines were the first to use in a helicopter assault, something they planned in the future to always use. Sadly, the um, Suez campaign got a bad name because the politicians couldn't quite hack it. Um, quick look at Julian's and my headquarters ship, awful lots going on. I'll leave you to work out what, but that was typical day in St. Carlos Water. The military need to retain such a valuable and highly flexible worldwide amphibious capability was slowly set aside. The main political cause for this failure was, I suggest, due partly to the financial constraints brought about by the cost of World War II, the subsequent disbandment of the empire, and then the withdrawal from east of Suez in 1971, despite our defense commitments to the Commonwealth and colonies, as well as globalization and perhaps the welfare state. Add to that preoccupation with NATO and the Central Front and our attraction to the European Union. Operations out of the NATO area, by my time, would only be carried out with allies. That was the political dream. By 1982, 38 years on from Overlord, for a variety of military reasons created by that what I would describe as short-sightedness being a naval officer, um, an amphibious capability had almost gone from our naval armory. This was perhaps inevitable by the loss of the strike carriers, because air superiority over the landing area had long been seen as a prerequisite for an assault. Those lost carriers offered the essential air defense to both the ground forces and supporting shipping. They were also able to provide interdiction and quick reaction close air support to the Marines and the soldiers almost anywhere in the world. While airborne early warning and electronic intelligence uh, and warfare capabilities, as well as helicopter support, were all additional and sometimes vital carrier borne assets. Since the end of World War, Second World War, the Royal Marines had been committed as infantry on counterinsurgency and similar operations in a large number of places overseas and in Northern Ireland. They and the Navy had drifted apart. However, despite their infantry tasks, the Marines had retained their strong contacts with the US Marine Corps, and they continued to understand well the, tried, the um, proven doc uh, amphibious drills that Admiral Ramsey developed. By the early 1970s, the Navy had disbanded that role and the staff of Commodore Amphibious Warfare. Luckily, at the request of the Royal Marines, it was resurrected 
but only some two years before I was appointed. The job was, perhaps inevitably, recreated on a shoestring. My staff was small, junior, and, of course, very inexperienced. There were too few of them to watch keep, and several war rails were not covered because we would always be protected by an admiral with a larger staff. I was not expected to have to fight my way in. Our NATO role was a simple reinforcement of up to a maximum of two commandos in a time of tension. This, we were told, would be completed before the Soviets decided to attack us. At least that was the political argument. It was another dream and a military nonsense to both Julian and me. As a result, by 1982, the Navy had forgotten almost everything about real amphibious operations and saw it, uh, there was a tendency to see it as wholly a Royal Marines problem. Some even saw my job as similar to that of a convoy commodore. I'm afraid amphibious operations are very different, definitely none of those things. The, on the 2nd of April, all this was to be tested. For political reasons, we sailed on the 6th and the 7th of April, obviously in a mad rush. We were fully loaded, but loaded in a shambles. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office had been in talks with the Argentinians, who had made it clear they wanted sovereignty of a strategically important British colony. However, there were no contingency plans. The result was that no military concept of operations uh, could be finalized in the time available before sailing and it left far too little time for the Marines to decide what they needed to take with them. It was impossible to plan in the detail that Admiral Ramsey would have expected. He often had years to do so. The Marines' stores and much of their kit was stowed on board without any idea of how it would be landed or in what order it would be needed. Even petrol was found stowed below decks alongside mortar ammunition. Admiral Ramsey must have been turning in his grave. Fortunately, we had a brief spell at Ascension Island, and by then, Julian Thompson, who was my landing force commander, and I had an idea of how we should wish to carry out the operation. This was submitted to our commander-in-chief, Admiral Fieldhouse, and was finally approved by the cabinet. Massive compromises were needed. We couldn't emulate Suez with a helicopter assault, and we, has, we had far too few of them. It was back to basics with landing craft, but it worked. This is how my job as the KTAF, as the Americans call it, Commander of Amphibious Task Force, was. An amphibious assault is primarily a naval operation as the approach and defense of the force, as well as the logistic offload, is in my naval hands until the landing force commander is happy to go it alone. Until then, his duty is this. Whoops, sorry, that, I've missed one there, haven't I? Um, no, that's right. Um, in terms of command organization, it is normal to arrange a following slide. It's what we practice twice a year on exercises with our NATO allies. Now you can see that the Commander Amphibious Task Group and the Commander Amphibious Group are the same chap, and you'll, that'll come clear later. When the landing force commander is happy to go it alone, and he's got all his kit ashore, knows what he's got to do, it becomes this. He's independent, goes to another commander perhaps, and comes back. I go back um, to pick up someone else probably. In 1982, I waited inside St. Carlos water and picked up five brigade. Unfortunately, Admiral Fieldhouse had neither a naval officer nor Royal Marine on his staff with experience of amphibious operations. The command structures he ordered were not those that we exercised, 
and were actually impracticable. They were also misleading to our colleagues in theatre and at home. But luckily, Julian and I got on well together, and it could have been very different if we hadn't. Personalities, as you heard, do matter greatly, especially in a difficult situation like that. All the troops were safely landed, and the logistics offload began. And this part was frankly a nightmare, for some of the reasons mentioned. It became worse when 5A Army Brigade came out, um, although it was no longer technically an amphibious assault, but an administrative landing. Five Brigade and the Navy had not had the opportunity of training together at all, so there was, not, there was inevitably many misunderstandings on both sides. Far more than with the Marines, who understood far better the way the Navy worked. And that, I think, was one of the greatest strengths in the campaign, and it was showed. Some of the more obvious problems, whoops, here we go, um, are listed here. I didn't know the manifests, cargo manifests, of all the ships that I had to offload. This became a huge problem. Uh, logistics regiment people and my staff were rushing around deep down in the holds of ships saying, I want that crate out. And so the ship would have to, if, if it was that urgent, the ship would have to move endless crates and shuffle this one out and then put them all back again and lash them all down for sea. The idea was to have what the Julian wanted first at the, at the entrance, and it went on like that, quite sensibly, logically, well planned, but it didn't happen. I think Admiral Manzi would have been mortified. The lessons that he had learnt had all been forgotten, especially the need for detailed planning Yes, we sailed early for good political reasons, but why were there no contingency plans which might have calmed this down and got things in the right order? They just weren't there. Was it complacency in the Foreign Office that we're talking to these nice Argentinians and therefore there'll be nothing, there's no risk of anything happening while we were talking? Or was it just incompetence? I suspect a little bit of both. There's a natural but unfortunate tendency, not just in peacetime, to focus on the fighting troops and forget the essential logistics. After all, doing a landing and having to offload all the kit and put it all back again costs money. There's an so Admiral Ramsey was not alone in this opinion. A contemporary of his clearly felt much the same. In 1982, 30 years on, 38 years on, I think we were undoubtedly uh, amateurs at the job. Certainly, my naval staff was, and I was. I think Julian's staff was probably a little bit more professional, but I think they were still more concerned with the fighting part of it than with the background. And a lesson to learn. I've no doubt that the Falklands campaign would not have been so successful without the expertise and the integration of hundreds of years of the Royal Marines. But I have to say that commanding such a variety of people and assets was challenging, obviously, but huge fun. And with better planning and training, the casualties of both men and ships would have been far less. So, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree with me. We've had a truly splendid panel in which we had four different but colliding interpretations and arguments. The floor is now open. The microphones are on either side of the auditorium. So if you could please put your hand up, and when you receive the microphone, if you could give us an indication of who you are, we can start over there. 
Mr. Chairman, sorry to hog the uh, meeting once again, but uh, having heard from the distinguished panel in front of us, it becomes more obvious every moment to me that um, Admiral Chalmers' biography of Ramsey is well titled Full Cycle, because not only does it deal with Operation Dynamo, but also with Operation Neptune Stroke Overlord. Sir, now, sir may I, coming in, jet lag, know your name? Uh, Michael Simpson, University oh, of Michael, Toronto. for heaven's sake. <laughs> Too far away. Hello, Michael. Right. Hello. Um, I want to dwell, really, not on Operation Dynamo, but on what uh, transpired or might have transpired in the weeks following. We all know that um, that was followed by the Battle of Britain and also by Churchill's inspiring speeches, uh, including, uh, we shall never surrender, and so on. But it seemed to me that the more I learned about the planning for D-Day undertaken by Admiral Ramsey and also by General Morgan, which took nine months in its gestation, and involved, as we've heard, many thousands of ships, uh, hundreds of aircraft, thousands of vehicles, and many, many thousands of men, plus the Mulberry Harbors, Pluto, and assorted uh, logistic uh, enterprises, that in the light of all that, I would think that it was impossible for Hitler to mount a successful Operation Sea Lion, because uh, that would have to be mounted in the space of a short period of time and with few windows of opportunity to get across the uh, channel, um, with no German Navy to speak of to support it, with the Luftwaffe unable to secure command of the air over the channel and over the landing beaches, and also a total lack of specialized landing craft. I know Andrew Gordon and colleagues have addressed this issue uh, once before, but I wonder whether members of the panel and indeed of the audience think I am right in saying that the German invasion of Britain in 1940 would have been impossible. Thank you. Right, splendid. That, that's a splendid opportunity, I think, for each of the panel to uh, contribute on that. And I'll start with Paul. I think it would have been impossible. I'm still trying to get my eyes and ears across the Atlantic. Um, I think it would have been impossible. I, I just don't think that uh, there's any chance that other than that all of the Royal Navy would have been committed mm -hmm. southwards. The amount of uh, torpedo boat, uh, destroyer, and behind them cruiser, light cruiser, another firepower would have been uh, far too much. The uh, command of the air would, had not been tested at, yet at, uh, at the Battle of Britain, but command of the air was there latent, very well planned. Uh, and w when we switch it, Michael, to the other side, to the, to the German side, and uh, you're right, their, their capacity, their understanding, their lack of preparation uh, meant that they were quite, quite terrified at the idea of being thrown across the channel. This, this was not on the plan. They liked beating up the French and Poles when they could, but going across those watery uh, 20 miles was not for them. So. Uh, it, the Operation Sea Line had to be planned, had to be planned for the great man, but he was already turning east as soon as France had been defeated. And I often wonder whether it would have been rather nice if they had tried to get across the channel because they might have lost a, a lot and learned a lot. But I, I cannot but agree with you that uh, Sea Line it would have been so, so difficult. It could not start, there was the, they could not have air power uh, coverage for very, very long. All the things were against them, and uh, there was a hope that, of course, they would not come, but I, I am radical enough to think it would be nice if they had come, <laughs> and we'd done something about it. Thank you very much. Richard. It's been persuasively argued by Christopher Page, the last uh, head of the Naval Historical Branch, that uh, Paul Kennedy is absolutely correct, that it, it simply could not have happened. Or if it had been attempted, it would have been a disaster for the Germans. Um, I agree with a slight proviso, a slight caveat, that had 
the Germans been really prepared in their minds to carry out such an operation with the shock uh, of uh, the unpreparedness of the British Army to deal with an invasion and with enough improvisation on the part of the Germans, it might just have been a runner. But I think, on the whole, that Paul Kennedy and Christopher Page are right. Uh, I would agree again. It's, the, it's Chris Page's explanation how the, the Kriegsmarine had lost so much uh, in the early operations in, in Norway, and it was not going to be in a position to support close in a landing in any case. Oh, I can't remember whether, whether Ramsey came to that opinion in 41 or 43, but that's certainly something he expressed. In looking at this uh, situation, he thought that the, a German landing couldn't last more than a, uh, about 30 days, I think it was, so long as the home fleet came south, which he had no doubt that it would come south. And, um, and, concert, and it, likewise, I think there has been work done on what the, the, the uh, control of the air is one thing, but using the air to attack <laughs> seaborne um, objects is another, and the Luftwaffe was not in a position to do that. They hadn't trained for it, they hadn't got the equipment for it. So that the comparator of the loss of ships later on to air power is not quite what the situation was in 1940. And I, from the back of my mind, I also seem to remember in about, in about 1960, 65, there was a significant war game conducted on the, a landing uh, in uh, Britain, and they came to the same conclusion that a German uh, landing could take place, it would penetrate short into the, the country, but it would very soon be cut off from its supplies. However badly organised the British defence was, they simply couldn't have pushed on much further. So all in all, the argument that the landing was plausible uh, is very, very thin, I think. Michael, would you like to have come I can't on? add to yeah. that. No, yeah. uh, one rather supposes that uh, the object of Operation Sea Line was to persuade the mm. British to negotiate mm. rather than mm. Uh, a viable operation of war. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a wonderful panel, but we have used up all of our time, and we really ought to keep as close to the budget as possible. Uh, otherwise, Alan will not thank me for chairing the session. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, would you please thank the panel? Uh, on. on the